Good evening. Hi, how are you, Isaac? Good, how are you? Well. Good to see both of you. Likewise. Looks like maybe people are still drifting in if you want to wait just a couple of minutes. Of course, yeah. How are you, Jennifer? I'm well, yeah. <laughs> still um, standing, shockingly, you know. <laughs> That's, that's, that's as good as it gets in 2020. Right, right. Especially this time of the semester, you know, you're like limping to the finish a little bit earlier than I'm normally limping to the finish, which is disconcerting, but it's okay. <laughs> Sounds like progress. Well, I think it's um, 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Light at the end of the tunnel, semester is mm -hmm. going to be ending, you know, eventually. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm excited for this though, it should be fun. Yes, likewise. Very glad to be here. Maybe we can go ahead, it looks like the rate of entrance into the Zoom room has, has slowed down a little bit. So uh, you can go ahead, Isaac. Good, all right. Um, thank you. So I just wanna say briefly, um, uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Isaac Shubb and I work in the reference department at um, the main branch of the New Haven Public Library. And I just wanna welcome you on behalf of the library to the latest installment of the Democracy in America series. Um, a very welcome collaboration with Public Humanities at Yale. We're very grateful and happy for this series. And um, tonight's conversation is with um, professors Matthew Jacobson and Jennifer Richardson. And their topic is the psychological and political backlash against diversity. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Jacobson. Great, thank you so much, Isaac. Uh, thanks, thanks to you and uh, to all of our partners in the New Haven Public Library System. This has been a really important uh, partnership for us and we still look forward to the day when we can all be in the same room together. Um, they say a vaccine is on the way. I'm still waiting for our outgoing president to give our incoming president a way of putting a delivery system in place, but okay. Um, I'm Matthew Jacobson. I'm the co-chair of the Public Humanities Program at Yale, and I'm delighted to welcome you all tonight. Um, thanks um, off the top to my colleague Karen Rothman, who's working behind the scenes, and also our associate Amy Depoy. They both have worked so hard and are working even now on this event. And I just want one program note. Um, on December 1st, um, which is also a Tuesday and also at 7 o'clock, um, we'll be speaking with my colleague in history, Bill Rankin, on the subject of maps and elections. Um, and anyone who's spent any time looking at the county by county red and blue map of the United States knows that there is a lot to discuss there. Um, but tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce and to welcome Jennifer Richardson. Uh, Jennifer took her PhD at Harvard and has taught at Dartmouth, Stanford, and Northwestern before joining faculty at Yale, where she's currently the Philip R. Allen Professor of Psychology. Uh, she's garnered awards and plaudits too numerous to name, including from the Guggenheim and the MacArthur Foundations. Um, I will linger over this one though. In 2010, she was named one of the 10 women on the rise, 10 women to watch in the next 10 years by O, oh, the Oprah Magazine. So how cool is that? Um, I think that's a first for our series. Professor Richardson's research examines multiple psychological phenomena related to cultural diversity. She examines how people experience racial and other forms of societal diversity, uh, whether efforts to navigate one-on-one -on -one interracial interactions or uh, the political consequences of the increasing racial ethnic diversity of the United States. Uh, much of her recent research considers how people reason about and respond to societal inequality and injustice. Her extensive list of publications include articles on uh, misperceptions of racial progress, class-based attitudes towards immigration, implicit and explicit bias, the psychology of racism, solidarity among stigmatized groups, Native American mascots in sports, 
uh, and the racial and political dynamics of the approaching majority minority United States, which is largely what will be our focus tonight. So Jennifer, welcome. It's so great to see you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be with you. And thanks to everyone who organized this and made this happen. I, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a very long time, and I'll tell you why, and I'd love to hear your take on this. Um, I feel as though you and I have been thinking about exactly the same thing for 10 years, um, but from completely different disciplinary perspectives. Um, and for those who don't know us that well, that thing is this, that um, the huge kind of demographic shift in the United States has been coming over the horizon for a while. And it's looked as though our changing demographics would deliver a more liberal and more cosmopolitan world eventually, which it might. Um, but I think that for the last 10 years, since sometime during the Obama years, both you and I realized that before that happens, there's going to be some really serious white supremacist vitriol that we're gonna have to get through. So, I mean, you can track the rise of Trumpism even before Trump rode down the escalator. And I think both, in, both you and I have been doing that. Um, is that how you see it as well? That's, that's absolutely right. In fact, I started doing this work um, long before Trump, um, but at the time when, at a time when it seemed that these um, reports of this projected so-called majority minority, and I, and I use that term in quotes because I actually hate it <laughs> and invite people to stop using it um, because of lots of baked in assumptions that are probably unfounded, but all this to say is it's projected, but the proliferation of news reports about it um, were just everywhere, right? Especially in, it, in between, sometime between 2008 was when the, the first time the Census Bureau sort of made that kind of projection and used that, that type of language. And then between that and the 2012 election, just more and more reports of this happening nationally um, were everywhere, right? CNN, you know, every news outlet, you know, had this information. Now, granted, this had already happened in California. So there was some reason to think it could and would happen, but people got really um, excited about it. And largely it was people on the left, the political left, uh, who got excited about it. And, you know, I think over, we're overconfident. And I think are still overconfident in what it would mean for uh, liberal left-leaning uh, progressive politics. And so you had people saying, well, I mean, you still have people saying demographics are destiny. <laughs> And I'm like, well, there might be some truth to that, except for um, there are lots of reasons based on the psychological literature suggest that actually know that the demographics are not destiny, meaning what groups currently align with which other groups and which political parties uh, shift and change based on people's group cognitions and, you know, expressed needs and values and any number of, of psychological threats. And so we started doing this work, I mean, quite honestly, because I was annoyed <laughs> by all of these, uh, you know, sort of this just information, these news articles for saying that not only this was happening, but ignoring the possible, and I thought quite likely psychological backlash to it, which in, the, in our first efforts were to, to demonstrate that actually large swaths of Americans, mostly white Americans, would react negatively to it and all of a sudden this would activate a sense of white identity and a, a need for sort of a racial solidarity among white Americans that we had not seen since the civil rights movement right so and we collected data because that's what I do I am a social scientist although I'm happy to chat and hang out with humanists <laughs> and learn from you all um, but you know, we collect data. So we look to see whether this was the case. And indeed, in study after study, we found evidence for exposure to this rhetoric of the so-called coming majority minority nation led white Americans to express more negative attitudes towards racial minorities on implicit measures, explicit measures, whether it's policies related to, uh, you know, racial, racial um, you know, equality just, you know, it was, it was omnipresent, you know, and that effect has been replicated by lots of other people. And actually we've, they, you can, it's now been shown in Canada, it's been shown with increasing immigration in many European nations. Um, so it's, it's a real basic um, social psychological effect. Yeah, I think there was about a minute 
after the 2008 election when people thought, wow, maybe demography really is destiny. You know, maybe, maybe the, uh, you know, the election of Obama is what our future looks like. Um, it is sobering to recognize that the first church burning of the Obama years was uh, four hours after the election had been called for him. Yep. <laughs> in 2008, a, a black church in Massachusetts was burned down. Yeah. Um, and in retrospect, it's really easy to see the Obama years as kind of that. Um, you know, when you look at the behavior of, of Congress and you look at, I mean, just the amount of, I mean, and I'm, I'm, it's relieving actually to hear both um, Barack and Michelle Obama speak frankly about that experience as they both have begun to do. That's right. Um, right. But, but those were, those as, as hopeful and inspiring um, as that presidency was in so many ways, those were some really dark years. Um, and what came over the horizon has just been devastating. Um, can I, first, before we talk more about your research, I would love to hear just your, your experience of the last 10 years as a citizen. It's kind of steeped in these questions. Um, what are your stages of reckoning with what the nation has gone through? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's a great question. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, you know, I, I mean, it's it's complicated, <laughs> right? And um, and I think part of the reason why we started doing this work was to really try to understand this. I think the larger question of, you know, if we are at this moment of shifting racial demographics, which we are on some, I mean, some levels. I'm not suggesting that that is not happening. What I'm suggesting is that it's not guaranteed what will look like on the other side of this, and certainly that it'll be more tolerant, right? That greater diversity automatically leads to, you know, greater sort of progressivism or, you know, more racial equality. That's more what I'm contesting. And I think our evidence suggests, you know, it's not in part because, you know, diversity is hard, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's in groups, people, it's people find it really challenging. And one of the things we know psychologically that we do when we feel challenged or threatened is we hunker down. And hunkering down at the group level means, well, you know, psychologically bonding with, you know, others who are like us that we feel that are also under threat or under threat in the same ways and trying to protect one another and often at the expense of who we see as a source of the threat. So for me, you know, trying to think about all of this um, in the, the past 10 years has really been about, you know, questioning and testing the, the extent to which the rhetoric around Obama um, and his election was um, true or likely to be true, right? So yes, the Obama coalition, you know, a multi-racial, uh, multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious uh, coalition with young voters, you know, that was powerful. And I think the, the power of it, you know, was, you know, again, threatening or frightening at least, or led to certainly anxiety for a lot of um, people who didn't see it coming, <laughs> you know, and especially a lot of sort of white Americans, like, oh, wait a minute, what? <laughs> um, and, but I think it was also um, in a different way, politically um, frightening for um, Republican elected officials. In fact, right, you know, after the 2012 election or really between the, the 2008 and the 2012, but, you know, concerns about the reemergence of the, this coalition in 2012, um, you know, our good friend Lindsey Graham, you know, said, you know, the demographics race we're losing, meaning Republicans. And he said, we're not creating angry white men fast enough. He said that. Jen Richardson did not say that. Lindsey Graham said that, right? And, you know, right after the 28 election, 28 election, right, the Republican Party said, we need to reach out. We need to reach out to Latinos. We need to reach out to Asian Americans. We can try to, you know, get some blacks on board. <laughs> but we really need to change how, how we're doing this because we, the demographics are against us. And they could have gone in that direction. But, you know, our research was showing, at least suggesting that they could go in the very opposite direction, the one they did, which is sort of doubling down on, you know, trying to increase the number of white voters, whether they're angry or not, I don't know. But certainly they were open to an appeal to, uh, you know, uh, I would call an ordinary white nationalism, not, you know, necessarily the most extreme violent form, but an ordinary one. And when I say ordinary, it means, it, you know, connecting to a sense of America as a land, a nation that um, white people should be 
you know, culturally dominant include and politically right. dominant. Privilege is an entitlement. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It, it owed us. It yeah, is but, owed us. Yeah, but a and, sense that that again is 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 what it's meant to be, as opposed to what has been so, and in some ways has been so because of the very policies that excluded people and suggest that we were not the democracy we claim to be. I imagine that you must have recognized um, the Tea Party as basically a white movement immediately. Um, was it frustrating to you to watch that unfurl with the, all of the kind of elbow room that the media gave the Tea Party to, to pretend to not be that? Like, yeah. how did you, like, <laughs> about the years between 2010 and 2012, like how were you, how are you kind of navigating this emergent world of a new kind of politics of, of white resentment or white grievance or white um, displacement? Yeah, I mean, it was it was mostly trying to recognize it for what it is and name it and not get, you know, confused about what it is. And the same thing happened, right, um, in 2016, the sort of economic anxiety story that, you know, popped up. And I'm, again, I am not suggesting that economic anxiety or more importantly vulnerability due to the economy uh, was not important and is and is currently I mean like look where we are in right now currently not a factor in how people are engaging in politics and more importantly how people are thinking about their own status and standing in society mm -hmm. but what is very clear from the data is it's not solely <laughs> economic anxiety that it that was driving support for Trump um, that there's something else that, you know, the status loss needed to be connected to something else, especially among white Americans. And that something else was this promise of a return to a safe, prosperous, white dominated, you know, dominant America, right? The make America great again. Well, when was the again? Sometime before all these minorities were here and were kind of, you know, messing stuff up for us. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I want to come back to your data and the nature of it and, and how you've collected it and kind of what some of your findings are. But I want to draw two more circles around this material first. One is, I just want to um, step backwards a minute because we've been talking, we've been focusing, I think, for good reason on the kind of the Obama and Trump years. But I just want to, um, to make the point, you mentioned California. Um, I've been tracking on this since the 90s in part because I'm older than you, but but also in part because- um, I'm like Two I'm, years I'm, or something, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm an, but I'm an immigration historian. So for me, this story really probably starts in the Reagan years, but especially it comes to the fore in California in the Pete Wilson years and the discourse around white displacement uh, around immigration and, and Prop 187 and, um, the English movement and all of that. Um, so it's important to recognize this as a, as a pretty stubborn feature of our political culture that goes way back. Um, but the other thing, I'm, and I'm really curious um, to hear you talk about this, is how you think about, in this context of what you were just talking about, the kind of um, the kinds of formations, identity formations that get mobilized by states of anxiety. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you understand kind of human nature versus culture or history in parsing this out? Um, you know, when you're thinking about something like that white sense of displacement, how do you think about that zone where the psyche, the individual psyche meets the culture or the kind of broader historical forces? Yeah, that's a that's a, a great question, um, and you know I, you know so okay. Let me zoom, what's the right word for this? You know, let me I guess zoom out a little bit. I you know again I'm a psychologist. I'm a social psychologist. You know I really think about um, how do we shed light on the processes of mind that are um, involved in how people are making decisions or you know behaviors largely my work, although my field does much broader things, but really studies this question of inequality, diversity, sort of group cognition. So, you know, that being said, I think, you know, all psychologists are doing are really trying to, you know, demonstrate these sort of component processes <laughs> that are, you know, at the individual level that when bubbled up to enough from enough individuals, you know, demonstrate the patterns we see historically or even in the moment. 
So it's, you know, so I see these, I guess, as totally compatible um, and, and really speaking to one another, right? I mean, the psychology, the processes of mind, this group cognition, well, that is obviously uh, an arc, a cognitive architecture that we have that helps us survive as a species, right? We, we live in groups, right? We evolved in groups. Um, groups are protective. They give us identity and meaning. So nobody in my sort of, you know, field would say that we should abandon all of our group identities and group memberships, right? They're really important to us. They help us understand, you know, what is so and what's not so. Whether it's true or not, it still gives us meaning, right? That's also culture is expressed, right, through, you know, groups. That's how we learn about our heritage, our history, right? These are valuable um, things and powerful things to sort of help us cope, right? That said, <laughs> we, we also are um, vulnerable to the very groups we care about, um, leave us vulnerable to information um, that those groups are not um, doing so well, meaning valued as much as we thought they were in society. So when young, you know, especially kids of color first learn that, oh, maybe the society doesn't think your group is so great, that's painful, right? And they learn it pretty early. But also when we learn that our groups that we care about are, are really valuable to us have engaged in really bad acts. So right now, you know, we are in this moment of learning, um, or many people are learning, or rethinking the history of this nation, right? And for many people, that is incredibly threatening, right? Rethinking the relationship of, of slavery to our current moment. Right, rethinking what Columbus was, what he did, how should we value him, rethinking the these sort of monuments to the Confederacy, rethinking Native American mascots, right? All of that is, you know, what people in my field call a sort of a value threat to the self, a moral threat to the self. And we really want to believe our groups are morally good and right, because that's part of how we understand ourselves as morally good and right, and we really want to believe that. So these types of um, what we call social identity threats or group cognition, group threats are, you know, they can lead to all kinds of, um, oh, what's the right word, um, attacks <laughs> against people um, who, you know, lay, lead to them or, you know, levy them. And more importantly, a, a, an attempt to double down on, you know, the groups, our, our beliefs, our myths, our stories, right, that culture gave us that told us we are good, we are destined, we are the chosen ones, whatever, you know, language we have, because every culture has some language like this, right? And, you know, and to push back, to fight hard against anybody who's contesting it. So, so you know, for me, what we're demonstrating, you know, in this line of work, but also in our work looking at support for Confederate monuments and support for, you know, Native American mascots, you know, and all of this is, you know, actually, they're all kind of the same. <laughs> they're reactions to, you know, either literally the shifting racial demographics of the nation or what people think that might mean. So if you, you know, want to stay politically dominant and culturally dominant, and you also want to be a democracy, then you actually have to do something about all those people of color, right? <laughs> like that, that, that is actually not compatible to have a more diverse, you know, a greater share of the population be folks of color, and you stay a democracy if you don't want them to have a greater share in the political process, right, and more political power. So that's a, that's a tension. But it also means more people, more different types of people are contesting the stories that we tell, are testing the, the, the narratives that we have, our national sort of mythology about what is so and why and how we achieved our greatness and whether it's predestined or not, right? That's being contested in ways that um, for many people, it's the first time it was contested and that is painful, right? It's hard to hear you know, that kind of information. And it's even harder, again, when there are other things going on, like, you know, a pandemic, <laughs> economic collapse, <laughs> and, you know, it feels um, uh, like a violation to say, oh, and by the way, you know, yeah, we're not that great right now, but we also weren't that great in the past either, <laughs> right? right? Like, that's terrible the thing to say, even if it actually might be true. Right. Well, this is the thing. So I still, I'm, I'm not forgetting that I want you to talk about your data, but I, I still have more questions uh, as, as one does. But this one, I guess, is a kind of a philosophical question, but you, you might have like a real kind of nuts and bolts answer to it. Um, the fact is that we never have had a fully functioning democracy. 
it's not as though the gods had promised us that this could work. Um, so in your view, I mean, could, can, you, you, can you imagine such a thing as a completely multiracial, multivocal functioning democracy without, you know, without heron vote kinds of stratifications, without, you know, slavery and other kinds of oppression, without, you know, all of the things that have impeded what the word democracy means in ideal terms. Um, is this, is this um, imaginable to you? So it is imaginable to me only because um, I am a person of faith. <laughs> so it, I'm not sure it exists in like the realistic, but it exists in sort of my yeah, imagination only because I think we either do that, right? Especially given where we are as a nation, or we do something that's really sinister, right? So we either do a sort of a minority rule, South Africa apartheid thing, um, or, right, I mean, that, you really have a couple of roads, I guess, right? So we, you know, we, we either try out this multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, uh, small D democracy thing, which nobody has ever done, right? So it's not like, yeah, United States did it, you know, and now we backed away from it. No, we've never done it, but no one has actually done this, right? So I, so I believe that it's possible. I have to believe that to keep doing this work, quite honestly. Again, the myths we tell ourselves maybe just to stay in the fight, but to get there, it's gonna take a lot. Um, and, and, and certainly, it's not um, predestined. I think that's like, if anything, that's my sort of main message to people, especially who really want to see that, who are really, you know, working hard for it um, and believe in it, you know, I'm like, it's not just gonna happen over time. We can't just wait it out. One, it's not fair to all the people who are currently struggling, trying to survive, trying to live, who will have to wait out, you know, how many decades of inequality and oppression <laughs> until we somehow magically figure it out. No, that's not how it works. Um, but also to be clear that, again, this is terrifying to large swaths of people for lots of different reasons. One, it's just, you know, for the first time, they're wondering what America will look like for their kids and will it be something they can recognize? And more importantly, will it be, where will they fit in it? And I don't think that those are unfair questions. Like, again, I think that's what I sort of call ordinary nationalism where you're like, well, yeah, this is happening. I don't quite know how to feel about it. I am worried because it's uncertain. And of course, sometimes then sort of elites with, you know, bad intentions come in and fill in those concerns with things that are, un uh, that are untrue and scary, like, you know, Cory Booker is going to come to your suburb and <laughs> do whatever Trump kept saying Cory Booker was going to do. But, you know, the scary black person or the scary poor people that are going to move to your town, right? So, well, I mean, part of it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. To, no, I just am curious on that point. I mean, you're a psychologist. Um, how much of that feeling do you attribute to a kind of projection where the shrinking white majority fears that actually as a minority, they will be treated the same way they've been treating other groups for 400 years? Is that, is that an important part of the dy dynamic psychology? I think, it, I think it's, a part, it's, it's a part of it. I think that is... Um, what, yes, yeah, something, in fact, I'm collecting some data on that very idea right now to get a sense of, of how, um, what piece of it, you know, um, is playing. I don't, you know, I don't know how, how much those fears specifically, you know, especially when, right, under any best, even, you know, even aggressive estimates, right, this so-called shift is like, you know, 2050 to 2080, depending when you count, right? White Americans are still 48 to 49 percent of the population. <laughs> no other group is all that large, um, and it 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 suggests some natural, quote unquote, you know, coalition among racial minorities that we know does not exist. We see over and over it doesn't exist, and people are surprised every time it doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, even if it feels like it's there, it's not there, right? So, you know. So right. and, more specifically and, concerned about that, the larger concern, right, this white, not white, you know, boundary is um, completely imaginary. And this type of rhetoric about the so-called majority minority and this kind of zero sum thinking just leads people to actually think to behave more 
you know, and from that position, rather than thinking about all the, the various, you know, ways in which a more um, diverse, pluralistic, you know, United States could either be the same in ways that people like or people don't like or be better than, than it has been for them, um, you know, for any number of reasons. But, you know, that d uncertainty is, um, it, I think is that's that's the most frightening part. The, the uncertainty and the loss, the, the presumed actual loss of status, right? That's the piece that people, you know, are not um, seem to be most triggered by. Like I, my group, whatever it is, this future is going to be, we're going to have less of a say in it, right. and that right. is terrifying. Right. Yeah. I mean, come to think of it, the 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 retribution argument probably requires white people to know more than they actually do <laughs> about, about the history of racial oppression. Yeah. Well, it is fascinating, right? So, you know, in another line of work, I look at people's, you know, beliefs or lack thereof, knowledge lack thereof, of historical racial injustice and current, you know, racial inequality. And, you know, people either don't know or won't say they know a lot, but yes, they're sort of afraid of like turning the tables. I'm like, but you said it wasn't that bad <laughs> at Jim Crow. So if Jim Crow wasn't that bad, then why are you so afraid of it, right? It is a little bit of a, but you know, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. So we should use it for our psychological gymnastics. <laughs> so finally now, and also I want to invite um, audience members to submit questions either in the chat or um, through the, the Q and A little function at the bottom. But, um, but I have a few more. So, so now you can take us through the data. You talk to us a little bit about your process. You know, how do you collect the, the data that you collect? What are some of the questions you're asking? And, and what are some of the takeaways that, that you've you know, felt are most important in these last years? Yeah, so we've you know, done a lot of different kinds of studies, but the most, um, I guess, prototypical, would, you know, something along the lines of this very straightforward, um, you know, no, nothing complicated and fancy where we literally just recruit samples of Americans, sometimes white Americans, if we're focusing specifically on that group, um, sometimes a, a broader a broader you know more racially diverse sample but we expose we ask people to read information from the census you know um that is about this this shifting racial demographic right this change in the national um uh the nation's racial demographics and either they are randomly assigned to read that right and again it's always uh, you know veridical information right we're not we don't lie to anybody we don't say anything that has not been said by the census and sometimes it's we, we literally use what the census has put out. Sometimes we use what some media um, outlet has put out. So they either read that or they read some, um, you know, information that's meant to control for any number of things. So sometimes it's, okay, read instead about the current racial demographics, right? So that's sort of controlling for the salience or just thinking about race, but not, you know, activating sort of this projected sort of white minority thing. Um, sometimes, you know, again, a very strict control um, in studies, we have them read about a very similar racial slash ethnic demographic shift in a different majority white country. So in the Netherlands, right? And we just pull their statistics from, <laughs> from their, you know, Census Bureau right there, you know, um, and then sometimes we're controlling for other things like other shifts that are happening that the census has reported on. So um, at the time, one was increasing geographic mobility, um, again, depending on who it is, we've used uh, control that is um, the aging population. So if we're looking at let's how do young people. So one question we had, right, is do young people show these same tendencies to express more racial animus after exposure to this, you know, so called majority minority shift, you know, because they're young and we think that young white people are more tolerant because people keep telling us that. Well, no, they also show greater expressions of racial bias um, to, you know, when they're exposed to the shifting demographics and, you know, compared to that the country's getting older, right? So another shift that's an outgroup not relevant to them, right? So, you know, again, by and large, Consistently, we find that um, when exposed to this information about the increasing racial, di racial diversity of the nation, white Americans express more um, uh, racial animus, um, sort of pro-white, anti-minority attitudes. Um, they're less likely to support policies that are designed to you know, support um, 
integration <laughs> of certainly affirmative action, any number of policies. Um, and that's just, you know, true. We've just seen that, you know, pretty consistently. Um, recently, we've actually seen some uh, divergence by political identity. So all of those studies, you know, our main studies we did before Trump became president, interestingly, sort of after he came, and we never saw any divergence for, you know, by political ideology. So white liberals showed this effect, white conservatives showed, everybody showed the effect, right? Uh, Trump got into office and then all of a sudden we started seeing some divergence where liberals actually became, um, said they felt less threatened and sort of more tolerant um, reading about the shifting racial demographics and conservatives sort of stayed threatened and got, you know, more threatened. So that that is relatively new. We're still trying to think through right. what that means and, and how to, to what to make of it. But it is an interesting shift that is consistent with other work by political scientists showing this post-Trump um, divergence with liberals becoming more racially progressive. I mean, like outpacing racial minorities in their racially <laughs> progressive attitudes uh, right. and, and conservatives doing something else. It's fascinating because, I mean, at the outset, I was announcing the event about mapping, but this really maps onto that county by county totally. red and blue in a way that's just fascinating because when you look <laughs> at the, the pools of blue on the map are all either cities or, or um, Indian reservations. That's right. <laughs> Those are the only <laughs> pools of blue. And the thing that it seems to suggest about cities is that it's not just that those are where the greater concentrations of people of color are, but actually the white population in cities is also more liberal. That's right. And right. so, I mean, that you could take that as a kind of a hopeful suggestion. Don't, don't fall for the trap. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, so walk me through this. <laughs> yeah, what, I mean, <laughs> what, do I, what do I need to know? So, yes, I think that, again, each of the, I mean, I, I think what's important to think about, at least, you know, at least my caution, um, and this is as someone who was roundly poo-pooed after we first published our data showing that not only the sort of the increased uh, racial animus, but the part that people didn't believe was that actually both white liberals and white conservatives, after reading about the shifting demographics, also uh, expressed more support for con the conservative um, ideology, uh, more conservative uh, policies, both race-related and not race-related, so like drilling in the national <laughs> wildlife, right, you know, of course, tax policy. Um, so, you know, a whole full swath of, um, of policies, you know, after exposing to the shifting demographics, uh, both white liberals and white um, uh, conservatives shifted to the right. And so when we published this, right, people, um, you know, you know, you know, I mean, it got published, so that's a good thing, right? <laughs> the data were sound, but lots of people in the media poo-pooed it because this was at the time where everyone said, no, 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 we outnumber them. Demographics are destiny. This is not going to come to pass. I mean, in the, my moment of fame and shame, although they didn't say my name because I guess I wasn't, I was still at Northwestern and they, they don't say, <laughs> they don't say your names when you're still at Northwestern. Some of the Yale you get a, a mention, but all this to say, Chris Hayes and Reverend Al Sharpton had a whole conversation about this, that's Northwestern study and, you know, how it had to be wrong <laughs> on Chris Hayes's former show. And I'm like, okay, but no, it's not. But I guess I'm happy to be mentioned. Mentioned, but no, it's not wrong. So, and this was all before Trump, right? Now, and at the same time, right? All these books, the end of white Christian America, the brown of America, brown is the new black, whatever, what, all of these. And I'm sitting here screaming like, no, stop saying that. Cause one, it's probably not true. And the worst then it's probably not true. And it's animating all of this, right. you know, angst and concern and, and shifting well, soft, Democrats to the right. And so if you believe in, again, and I should be clear, not that it's bad to be a conservative, especially, you know, like, you know, in terms of, you know, small C, you know, policies, but we do know that the current positions of the Republican Party, and even more so now, are not consistent with any interventionist, but, you know, activist measures to reduce racial inequality in this country. And I think that, to me, is, you know, why this was so um, troubling, this rhetoric around demographics being destiny and going to lead to this right. racially progressive outcome. Because I'm like, no, that's actually what's most at stake here. Yes. No, and there's also, I mean, the historian in me, in me wants to point out that there is a cyclical nature to this. I mean, Time right. Magazine ran a cover, The Browning of America, in, I, I want to say, the early Reagan years, in the early 80s. 
Um, and then, you know, the cycle just spins around and there's this, the spiking of fever in the 1990s around immigration. And then there's the spiking of fever. I mean, you know, when you have an African-American in the White House, all kinds of fevers begin to spike. You get, right. yep. you get more fear of immigration, you get more, more, more Islamophobia. I mean, virtually every racial front becomes more heated. That's right. Um, but this is like, it's a really deeply rooted thing in the culture. Um, some questions have started to come in and, and this one, I'm going to take them out of order so bear with me audience members but here's one that seems to it, it it speaks a little bit or it asks a little bit about something that you were just um, speaking about and also called it's just is an interesting question about your own um, methods can you comment on this phenomenon whether real or constructed of shame on the part of white people who vote for trump is it an alibi for people who don't want to accept that people want to vote for him um, is it real and how can you measure it how can we think about it yeah, great question. You know, I um, I don't know yet what to think about it, and I do th I I can certainly imagine there are some people who feel some sense of shame, um, in part because, but in part, especially if they happen to be maybe in a urban place or just you know around in a community that is so demonstrably anti-Trump. Right. And of course, the reverse is true, too. Right. So this, you know, gets back to the the basics of group cognition. We want to belong to the communities that we hold dear, that we affiliate with, that we sort of get, get some meaning from. And when we are, you know, out of sync, so to speak, especially on something that that people are taking so seriously, not that they shouldn't, but that people take, take seriously and actually that they um, see a behavior that they see as defining in some ways of your um, your membership in the group. Like, you, so if you don't vote the right way, you might get cast out of the group. And, you know, in some ways, the moral island, because we've now moralized these, these decisions and politics so much that, yeah, I can imagine for people who are so positioned, so Trump voters who are largely in blue areas, you know, New Haven, <laughs> um, New York City, that there might be some shame, um, whether they're white or not. In fact, I think if anything, the non-white Trump voters <laughs> might have some sort of something, you know, feelings needing to hide um, uh, uh, than, than, than white voters. Um, but, and then the opposite, right? Biden voters who are, are um, positioned in places where they're not supposed to vote for him. In fact, I know, uh, you know a good friend of mine, her father, who's you know, in Oklahoma, 80 something, white man with a pickup trunk, you know, voted Biden, you know, he wasn't ashamed. He had his signs out, but they were like, you know, stolen multiple times because, you know, he was so out of sync with his community and people tried to shame him for that. Like, what's wrong with you? Because, you know, you're supposed to be one of us. So I think there, there could be something there. Um, and, and I think it, 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 you know, but we don't know, like we need more data. I, you know, I, I would have to think about how to um, measure it and it's hard to know, you know, after the results, it turns out, I mean, except for this one where people are holding on to their beliefs about what happened that may or may not be true, but under most circumstances, <laughs> after the election results, people who voted for the person who didn't win, um, kind of like back away from their commitment to that person <laughs> and they um, kind of shift more to the center. This, something is odd is happening in this election. So, so we'll see. Um, but those, the people who are adamant about Trump are not ashamed. They were never ashamed there. <laughs> so that might make it hard to sort of detect people who felt some shame about it. From, from your point of view as a psychologist, um, how important is the kind of leader that Trump has been to the kind of mass psychology of his followers? Like, could, could someone with the same kind of harsh immigration policies and, you know, or the whole package, the whole political package, but a different behavior, a different style, um, can that single leader affect the masses differently? Or is this just something that's bubbling up from below in your view? I mean, he's, yeah, Trump is unique in, in many ways. Um, he's, yeah, it's not just the rhetoric. It's not, you know, it's also the celebrity about him. It's also the, um, you know, un, you know, almost over the top unwillingness to, 
you know, accommodate other people's considerations and concerns, especially women and folks of color, right? So there, there's some performance that he's doing that might be authentic to him. I'm not suggesting it's not authentic, but that um, really, you know, connects with people. Now, and I think actually this might be where shame comes in. So people who are feeling ashamed for, you know, maybe not, you know, having the right, you know, quote unquote, the right, the most egalitarian or PC or, you know, thoughts about different groups who were concerned about where they might fare about uh, the shifting racial demographics, you know, especially in a, um, you know, after the, you know, collapse, the economic collapse in, you know, 2008, you know, I, there, there was, there's something about someone and someone like Trump who's an effective communicator um, of passion, of I see you, of I'm one of you, we're, we're the same, whether it's true or not, that is very effective. And it's not, you can, there's nothing, it's not only effective for the Trump supporters. I mean, many Obama supporters actually had the same kind of thing with him and some still do, right? you know, yeah. and, and it's not, it's, it's because they feel seen, they feel valued, they feel respected, they feel empowered. And that is, you know, that's really, of course, powerful after, you know, decades, if it's been, or maybe for Trump supporters, eight years of feeling, so sort unquote, of left behind, disempowered, or at least vulnerable in ways that they hadn't ever experienced before. Yeah, 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 I guess I just, I, it's clear that Trump has un unleashed something. Um, it was probably something that was already there always, <laughs> but he, he truly did unleash it. And yeah. I guess I'm interested in the kind of psychological yeah. dimensions of that unleashing. Yeah, um, well, it's, and it wasn't just Trump. I, and this is what I think, right. you know, for me, one of the most troubling signs during the, the 2016 election cycle was not so much Trump, which, you know, that was also just the whole celebrity no experience. Like, can we actually elect people who are public servants, not whatever this, right? So, I mean, I had a lot of objections, right? The same objections I have to people like, Oprah should run. I'm like, no, Oprah should not run, <laughs> right? Like, come on. Um, she, Oprah's lovely, let her keep being You said you were a woman to what? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, I just can't with that, right? But, but um, the most disturbing um, sign to me was when Steve Bannon got brought in um, to the campaign and he's, you know, just, you know, clearly and vocally white nationalists in the scary way, <laughs> not in the ordinary way, um, you know, and there was no pushback in the media at all. Like, okay, he's a new campaign manager. We're just gonna like, let this go. And then, oh, he's a White House advisor because people should have who they want. I'm like, yes, people should have who they want. <laughs> I agree. But I thought there were some lines that we actually would not and could not you know, cross. And that to me, you know, I guess both as a somebody who studies this stuff and somebody who cares about, you know, the livelihood of myself, but my, you know, family, um, that was actually really probably such a, that was such a scary moment, actually, for me personally and professionally. Like, wow, this is like the mainstream media is just going to accept this and not sure. call it out for what it is, you know. And, and that actually, in general, is something that terrifies me and, and not terrifies me. I shouldn't say it that way. It, it, it disturbs me, the just general, um, you know, whether it's cowardice or racial illiteracy <laughs> among, um, in the media to, to just call things what they are, right? This, okay. All these euphemisms for racism, for white nationalism. I mean, again, I'm not saying, you know, rope anybody in who uses the wrong word or doesn't know, you know, that it's, you know, Latinx or whatever it is, right? No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who have expressed white nationalist views. Right now, they should right. be called out, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree. I just thought the idea that that especially not just being on the campaign, but when Bannon was invited into the White House to That's just right. know that, that every single day he was going to be eight feet from the, from the Oval Office. That's right. It was just That's terrifying right. yeah. thought. And Stephen Miller, uh, right? Again, like there, there's, right. just, you know, just in the Richard Spencer, right? There were any number of them. And I'm like, this is, right. you and know, they, and instead of getting like completely, you know, put the pushback, they were getting profiles in the New York Times. It says, oh, aren't these characters interesting? You know? Right. It's an oddball group. 
Yeah, and which of course we hijinks will ensue. Yeah, and we yeah. should contrast that with you know regular old Van Jones, right? Who when he was whatever green jobs are, whatever he was in the Obama administration for like five minutes, got run out for right. being too controversial. Right. And so, you know, that is just like wow. I I I I'm still apoplectic about <laughs> about that shift um, and and the shift in what is acceptable in the mainstream right now. I think we have. We've gone so far that, you know, it's going to be hard to pull us back to any sense of commonality, um, sense of, you know, connection, sense of, you know, mutual respect. And, you know, and, you know, quite frankly, no, there are lines that we should draw and we should not go underneath them because that's actually an ugly past that did happen and we don't want to go back to it. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think for me, that's one of the reasons right now for, for this moment, some of the people who I find are most compelling are conservatives who have jumped off mm -hmm. the ship. Um, people like Steve Schmidt, who is just so eloquent on the betrayal that this presidency is. I mean, because, you know, you can get someone like Chris Hayes or Rachel Maddow, and they're, they're brilliant, and they're going to say all the things that, you know, you want said. But there's also something a little predictable about, and of course, this is the argument they're going to make. But when you hear, you know, Nicole Wallace or, or Steve Schmidt making these arguments, it's a, it's a, it has a different kind of um, I think it has a different, I don't know, it has a different ballast to yeah. it. No, well, that's right. Right. I mean, um, they don't, it, it doesn't seem self-interested and it doesn't seem, you know, just like kicking people, you know, in the, in the out group, so to speak, right? It, it feels. We have a, a, a question that will bring us back to the, the polarization piece, um, but I want to skip backwards because I don't want to miss any of these questions. There's one, this takes us back to a more kind of a methods and, and outlook question in your field. Um, there's an alarming rise in the number of studies whose authors try to impose associations between genetics and behavioral patterns. Um, do you mind sharing where you stand on the nature versus nurture spectrum when it comes to psychology and behavior? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's one of those um, debates that just needs to close. <laughs> right? Surely some of who, who we are as human beings is, is determined, right, by our genetics, by nature. Um, but of course, nature is not just our genetics. Nature is including, also includes the environments that we're growing up, that we grow up in and we are you know, exposed to. Um, climate, right? Um, you know, but obviously, you know, the, we're influenced by any number of, of uh, other social slash sociological input. So, you know, I just don't, um, yeah, I just don't do that, right? I don't, I don't really invest in that um, dichotomy um, at all. And, you know, I guess for the type of work I do where I'm really trying to, you know, think carefully about how we can bridge divides, help people to understand both that our group memberships are importantly meaningful, but also that we have a common humanity, right? So both these things are true and consist at the same time. <laughs> Thinking about genetics doesn't really help, right? You can't you can't intervene on people's genetics, and so there might be some component, let's just say, to to racial bias or to authoritarianism or to you know any number of related constructs that are you know in part born of our genetics. Okay. That's right. whatever, what, what can we do with the other 70%, right? Because that's something you can do, you can actually intervene on, you can actually think through, you can, right? So, so I don't, you know, pay so much attention to that. What I do pay attention to, I not pay attention to, but I don't really focus on that as, as relevant to the work that I'm doing besides it is what it is. Um, what I do focus on and pay attention to though, and I think it's very important is that we are, um, we do have sort of specific, probably, you know, evolved cognitive capacities that afford us the type of cognitions that can lead us to think of in terms of we or us versus them. And that is an architecture that we cannot ignore because even when it leads to negative outcomes, right, 
which it can, it can also lead to amazingly positive outcomes, right? Think about the collective pride you feel when somebody who's part of a, a, a group you care about does something fantastic, right? The same weeness that sometimes leads us to, you know, cast people out also allows us to have that sense of pride, right? So that's, that's very important to us. Um, but we need to understand, you know, what, where it comes from, why we have it, and why it's so important. And that is, you know, that's kind of the basic kind of evolved understanding of groupiness that we can't ignore. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think it's exactly um, the reason why historians in general are allergic to the idea of human nature, because that could just become the answer to every question. And then yeah. like, we might as well just close up shop, you know? Let's, so why yeah. instead, let's think about capitalism. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> that, I mean, and their propensities, right? There are, you know, pretens propensities for A, B, and C, right? And that's not, it, it, is, it is what it is, you know? Yeah. So here's another question, and it dovetails with the question I wanted to ask you. So I'm going to take the liberty of tacking my question onto okay. the this audience member's question. Um, what hope do you have for near-term depolarization amidst escalating culture and race wars and the solidification of Trump's Republican Party? Are we past the point of changing minds and at a point where hyper-partisanship is so extreme and enduring uh, such that we need to redesign our electoral and policymaking institutions to accommodate our polarized politics and salvage our ability to solve problems at the federal level? That's a great question from the audience. I will tack on, what does psychology as a discipline suggest when it comes to defeating white nationalism? Yeah, well, <laughs> does my field actually <laughs> suggest anything? I don't know, that I should get back, get back to you. But no, I think that, um, so we need to do both. We need to change minds. <laughs> um, we need to reduce polarization and we need to do what is necessary structurally to make our um, federal government, but also any number of state governments um, and states electoral systems more small d democratic. So we need to do both, right? I, I, I don't, you know, I think, I think that they're both incredibly important. I mean, look at the, um, you know, results in Georgia and it's in, it's in part obviously from registering voters, but it's also from changes in the structure of how voter registration happens, right? Uh, you know, in Mississippi, they changed how the governor I think is elected, right? It, into a more small D democratic um, process. You know, they also changed their flag, right? So, you know, so we could do some symbolic changes too, although I'm not a favorite fan of only symbolic changes. We need some material uh, and structural changes as well. So, so I think we need to do both. Um, but we, we cannot, um, we can't not consider um, people's, I guess, psychological well-being and, you know, the, what there is to gain from polarization, from white nationalism, from, you know, sort of pseudo, you know, ethno-nationalism nationally, but also in, 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 in subgroups, um, you know, there is some, you know, people get something from that. Again, there's a psychological currency to it. And so ignoring it um, would be a mistake because you can't just say, all right, stop investing in that <laughs> without giving people something else to invest in. And so I think we need to, you know, make connect, you know, connect the dots and say, I so get it. Yes, it would, would this is a tough moment nationally. And I think it's true for all of us. And we need to decide whether or not we are going to continue down this road, um, which I think is one of false promises, right? Especially the, you know, make America great again thing, right? The white nationalist project is one that is um, decidedly not small d democratic. It's also not consistent with American values. Um, and I think people have to almost choose, but I think approaching people with the truth about what's at stake, but also with a vision of the future that isn't terrifying, <laughs> that actually, you know, yeah, you're right. America's gonna look a lot different than it, you know, and maybe for your kids than it did for you but it's actually gonna be okay in here. Here are all the reasons why maybe, you know, and, you know, point to places that have not completely fallen apart that are more, you know, racially diverse or whatever it is, or, you know, point to our common um, Americanness, point to our actual um, fierce devotion that's common on both sides of to this thing called the American project, right? The American democratic project, right? The people who are most committed to it are often, can be on, on two different sides. We can point to common 
um, problems. I mean, the, the person who I think is doing the most with this is um, Reverend Barber, right? And the sort of Moral Mondays project, right? He's, he's saying like, you know, no, we have common challenges, but if common values, common fe fears, common needs, right? That's how you connect people, period, but also across party lines, because it's not about any of that, you know, like madness that we hear about people on the other side, right? It's not the, the demon that you're told they are. It's actually, you know, real people with real concerns and real um, uh, problems and, and, and saying, let's come together to solve them. Like, let's come together to make something different, yes, but actually great. And you know what? That's distinctly and, you know, the promise of America. I have to confess, I didn't think you could land this plane in an optimistic, <laughs> <laughs> but you did. And I we have that. to hold on to the hope, Matthew. We have to, right? <laughs> well, this hour has just flown by. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's really been an education and um, love to have you back actually, maybe in six months and we can take an assessment of where the world is at that yes. point. Yes. Yeah, that would, I, would, I would love that too. That'd be great. Thank right. you. Thanks well, so much. This has been thank, fun. Thank you. And thanks to all of our participants and attendees. It's, um, you know, like I said, we um, really look forward to the day when we can all be in the, the New Haven Free Public Library together again. Yeah. And that day will come. But until then, we do what we can. So um, wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Wear a mask. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> well, yes, and have will... Thanksgiving with your nuclear family in the same exactly. house that you're in. <laughs> <laughs> the bubble, the bubble. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs> Jennifer.